Great, perfect. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about teach everything you know. Um, I'm Carl Alexander. Um, I write, well, first of all, this is my Twitter handle. If you want to ask me questions um, or just annoy me or send me memes, I accept all those things. Uh, I also write at this address, carlalexander.ca. Um, I will also have a written uh, version of this talk ready uh, early next week. Uh, so if you just want a written copy on top of the slides, uh, it will also be in the description of the slides once I, I post them online. All right, so who do you trust online? What do they, ha actually, I'm just going to take a small pause here. I want the preview thing. Yeah. This works. Perfect. All right. So what do they have in common? They, they teach. They write on their blogs. They speak at work camps. They share code online. Um, and it's also why you trust them. It's why you want to buy products that they build, or you want to use their open source projects, or maybe you just want to hire them. And those are just some of the benefits that you can have from teaching. Um, and the best part is you can do it too, but there's obviously some obstacles to that. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, It'll be about the obstacles that you face uh, if you decide to start on this uh, journey into teaching. So the first obstacle, fear. Um, teaching is really scary at first. Um, as humans, we're, we're scared of a lot of things like spiders and heights. I'm scared of heights. I hate heights. Uh, and the worst part is each of these fears kind of affect us in a different way. And that's why I'm going to talk about them, but it's obviously you have to kind of go through them in your own way. So the first one that's really popular is imposter syndrome. Uh, if you're not familiar with imposter syndrome, it's this idea that you'll be exposed as a fraud if you, if you come forward and try to share or publish or do anything it's really common in developers, actually. I don't, I don't remember when I first heard about it, but I, I remember the first time I did, I was like, oh my god, this is, this is me. And I'm living it right now, <laughs> you know? Like, as I'm speaking to you right now, I'm, I'm living this imposter syndrome. I, I'm wondering, who am I to teach this to other developers? Because I've only spoken at four work camps. I'm, I mean, it might be more than most people, but to me it still feels like insignificant in the sense that what is for, like I could have gone up four mornings in a row and there's plenty of different ways that this could have gone wrong. So I'm just, it feels so insignificant. And the worst part is, uh, especially for me, because the way I pick my topics is if this was important, someone else would have done it already. And this is a really kind of scary part, I find, like for, for feeling as a fraud, like especially I think for, for BuddyPress developers especially, there's not as much content out there and it, it might feel like, oh, well, if it was really important for me to share this BuddyPress knowledge with, with somebody else, maybe somebody else would have done it already. Maybe David would have done it or JJJ would have done it. Why, why am I the one that has to do that? <laughs> but why, why am I the one that, that thinks that this is important? Shouldn't somebody else that's smarter than me have thought about it before? It's really hard to, to outrun uh, these thoughts. Um, but I also think it's, it's the best time to teach. Uh, why? Because you're in the trenches. Um, you're the one living with, with these feelings, with, with this uncertainty you're discovering. And it makes you authentic and re relevant to, to the people that you want to teach to. Um, because, again, you're in the thick of it. So it's not like you've done it before. They want to know what you learned right now. 
And it's also harder to do uh, the longer we wait. Um, that's because as humans, we're really good at, at storytelling and either embellishing or forgetting the, the bad parts that we, we don't want to remember. And often it, it just ends up looking like this. You're on top and you're like, oh yeah, it was easy. And then the person's at, not at the same level as you. So it's really important, I find, that you do it when, uh, as early as you can, because that's also when, it's, when you're in the same field as the people that you want to help. So it's really important. And it's why I'm doing this talk right now, because I want to teach about, I want to share what I've learned as a beginner while I, I still feel like a beginner. I've only done this for like a year. So I feel relatively new still to this, and I still remember what it is to feel scared to be in front of people like right now. And yeah, I think it's important to do it now. So the other thing that you're going to fear is judgment. Judgment of others, judgment everywhere. And I'm going to start with a, a small anecdote. I'm really scared of pressing the post button on Facebook. Um, I find that publishing on my site is really easy because you're like Frodo Baggins. You have the one ring, but nobody knows you have the one ring. If, if nobody knows you exist, it's easy to publish online. There's nobody that, that can come and see you and knows that you exist. But when you publish online, whoop, I skipped a bit too far ahead. But when you post online, that changes. It's like putting the one ring in Mordor, and this happens. And that's how I feel every time I post on AWP, by the way. I'm, I'm always like very, very scared that the evil on the internet is going to come and attack you. And that's how I feel each time. And I'm scared to be misunderstood because maybe the way I explain something wasn't uh, done correctly or people won't understand what I'm trying to teach or that I'll be called out uh, for trying to promote myself when I'm just trying to help them. Um, and at the end, uh, sometimes I'm scared to be hated because of it. And the imposter syndrome a bit feeds onto that um, fear of others because you feel like a fraud, but you, you feel like being called out. But I find that it's just, just a small aspect of it. And often public speaking, if anybody here has done it before, um, it magnifies those fears because now people are judging you in real time, like right now. You have an opinion of me. And I can't run away. Um, but that doesn't matter because there are ways that we can master our fears. Um, I don't like the term necessarily master um, or over overcoming. I feel that we just kind of learn to, uh, to live with our fears or to, to understand the feeling. It's a bit like love and hate. We all know what it, it feels to feel love and hate, and, but it's not something that you can run away from. We just learn to manage it. So how do you do that? Um, you face them over and over again until the feeling is familiar. And I know it, it's a lot easier said than done, um, but I'm going to use a small example of public speaking. Um, there's different ways that you can approach um, fear, for example, of public speaking. You can obviously speak at work camps, which in the large scheme of things are very friendly environments to, to speak at. Everybody's super friendly and excited to see you and it's very communal. But if that's still too intimidating, you can even go a bit smaller and, and just speak at a meetup. That's an even smaller group of people, so it's even less intimidating. Um, you can even speak at your office. So now you're speaking to coworkers, people that you know that you, you feel uh, comfortable with. Obviously, the first time is always going to be the scariest. Um, and the next time is going to be a bit better. And hopefully, you keep the ball rolling. And you know, there's no magic bullet for it. So it's just about taking small steps and, and keeping going. So I'm putting uh, some question breaks in between. I don't know if anybody has questions or things like that. I like answering questions in the middle if, if people have any. <laughs> yes, Jonathan. OK, so I have, I have a small anecdote for that. Um, 
I'll give two comp I'll, I'll compare what I did today versus what I did at WordCamp US. WordCamp US, I tried to uh, relax and not think about it, made it 10 times worse. Uh, <laughs> it made it 10 times worse because the more you, the more I thought about it, the more it was in the, I couldn't get rid of the thoughts about it versus what I did today is just kind of go eat, come sit in the back and move up to the front. Um, but I think it depends really on, on each person. Um, what I was trying to do when I was at WordCamp US is just to kind of take on like I meditate. So I was like, oh, I'll meditate before and it'll be better except apparently I'm not that good at meditation. So, <laughs> that, but uh, really just get in a flow where you, you're not thinking so much about the fact that you're coming forward because it just, it just initiates a lot of the fight or flight feeling. So like the more you can try to dodge that, the better it is. So the other obstacle would, um, I don't know actually, is there any other questions? All right. So the other, other obstacle when you start teaching is building teaching habits. Uh, if you look at your favorite teacher, um, like Tom McFarlane, JJJ, uh, anybody really in the WordPress community, they have one thing in common. They produce content regularly. They produce blog posts, they produce vi YouTube videos, they produce podcast episodes. But it's not really what they produce that's really important, it's that they produce it regularly. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, they never end the week with nothing. Um, and w what that means is that uh, the more you, you have this habit of, of having something to show to the world at the end of the week, the more it kind of builds on itself. Like It's like building an asset. You just have more and more of it. Um, so I, I really like it. But one does not simply start a new habit. So what can you do about it? I'm a big fan of starting small. Um, another personal anecdote, my first writing goal was a thousand words a day. That was a horrible goal. <laughs> and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I don't know if anybody here knows uh, Nathan Berry, but uh, he does a lot of uh, basically what I'm doing right now is teaching other people to teach online. And he had this post where he's like, I write a thousand words a day. And I'm like, sure, I'll write a thousand words a day. Except I don't like writing a thousand words a day, so that really didn't work for me. Um, and really, it comes down to human behavior. We always think that we can handle more, uh, but really, the best solution is to to break things down into really tiny, tiny habits. Uh, so my new writing goal was a hundred words a day. And really, 100 words a day is large enough that I have something. If you write 100 words a day, uh, at the end of the week, you have 700 words. And unless you're a long-form writer like myself, which I know a lot of people hate, 700 words is actually a pretty decent blog post uh, for most people. It's definitely better than the, you know, Yoast tells you, like, you need 300 words. That's actually three days. So it's really not that much. And it, it's small enough that I could finish it easily. So it's not, that's another aspect of, of, of goals. If you have to write a thousand words and you're not used to th writing a thousand words, it's daunting. But writing a hundred words, I'm pretty sure most people have typed a hundred words on Facebook today right now. So, <laughs> so it's really, it, it's, it's pretty achievable. But it was also small enough that I could do more. So let's say I got in the zone. Let's say you, often like the first obstacle that you have is just sitting down. So if you start sitting down and you start writing, you'll often end up with more than 100 words. So it was really, really useful about that. And it was also small enough that I could grow the habit. And by that I mean is like, if it starts getting easy to do, write 100 words, you write 150. And then you add, you add 50 and you add 50. And then you can even break it down after that. So let's say you're writing 300 words a day. You could write 150 for an article and 150 for well, I'm a programmer, so for documentation, because documentation's important. Uh, but it's a lot of writing. Training your willpower. So in behavioral psychology and just research in general, people tend to view willpower as a well. You're like, oh, 
I have so much willpower. I would just wish I, I could get more of this well. It's always a resource that we imagine that there's just more of, but it's really closer to a muscle in the sense that uh, when you wake up in the morning, you always feel more motivated to do things than at the end of the day because it fatigues. It, it grows weaker. Like You use it all day. You're like, oh, I'm not going to eat this cookie. I'm not going to eat this cookie. I'm not going to eat this cookie. And at the end of the day, you're just tired and you're like, I'm going to eat this cookie now. And, and it, it does worse when uh, we do worse when we don't let it recover as well. So I'm, by that, I mean if we don't rest well, we don't exercise, or we, we're stressed. Um, there's always a big difference between like if you have stress at work versus no stress at work, and your ability to, to do like ab habitual things that, that might not please you most of the time, but you do them anyways. Um, so this is another place where starting small is, is good, like I said earlier, because it taxes this muscle less. But you want to repeat it every day, because if you repeat it every day, you, one, you, you increase your strength of, of your willpower, but also it becomes easier to do. So you, you, you practice it until you need m a lot less, and then you can add new habits after that. So let's say um, I started off last year, I was writing, and then I added meditation, which has, has nothing to do with teaching, but it's just something else that I added. But it's, it's hard to add all these things at once if you don't kind of build it up slowly. And the other, other aspect of um, habits that is important is learning to pick yourself back up. Because things won't go well all the time. Uh, we all have off days. Um, and the idea that anything has to be all or nothing is really the worst thing um, that you can do to yourself. Um, I, we, all, we all go to work every day, but we all have sick days. We're not, you know, uh, it's really hard for, for people sometimes to dissociate the idea that if you fail once, uh, you've failed forever, but it's really something that you, you should not think about. Uh, failure will happen, and you really need to plan for those off days. Um, for example, if you write every day, what happens when you go on vacation? Well, I'll tell you what, please don't stop going on vacation um, because uh, you need to go on vacation, but really what's important is that you should plan for these situations. So instead of saying, oh, well, I'll be on vacation, I could just write in the morning instead. But uh, the idea of doing that is that you could take a break um, during your vacation, but in general, it's worth avoiding taking more than a, a I say a day off, but you can do two or three, um, because we forget and it tends to go downhill. Uh, our mind's really uh, crafty at finding excuses for, for us not doing things that don't, we don't really want to do. So if you give them a bit too much loose on the leash, uh, it'll just run away from you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, I think I, yeah, I couldn't talk about every anecdotal thing, but so, for example, for this one, uh, for writing, my initial, um, I had a, also an initial setup where I would say I will write something after two weeks. So I will publish every two weeks, I will publish something. So I had a hard deadline, um, and I would just arrive the day before and then just kind of write it all out and, like, I was just a slacker, so I would slack off till the end and, and, and do it. And I should have known better because um, a lot of the stuff that I, that I mentioned about habit, I, I'm very familiar with because I, I like a lot of behavioral uh, psychology research. And I should have known that setting uh, deadlines like that versus the small ones uh, 
would have set me up for failure. But like I said, sometimes we, we just think we'll do all right. You know, that's, that's why New Year's resolutions exist, is like we think we'll, we'll do fine, but really we should take it small and then grow from there. And um, I find, if anything, for this talk versus any other piece of material that I've, never, I've come across doesn't really, you see it a lot in habit blogs and stuff like that, but you don't see it too much in, in teaching or, or habit building around teaching. But I find that it's very important because I, I have a lot of friends in the WordPress community that, that wanted to write, and most of them still don't write. Um, because they're, they're just like, I'm gonna write an article and write an article. But often when you, begin, when you start, um, it's just getting words on paper that's hard. Like forget the, if, like the article's actually like too far ahead. Uh, you're, you're, really it's like the, things like the blank page. Uh, that's still really hard for me. Like once I, I get an article going, like once it's, it's a few hundred words in, it's a lot easier to sit down to. But once I publish it and I go back to it, even if I have an idea, an idea pad, it's still hard to, to kind of get the initial momentum. So people kind of um, forget about that or don't think, think they're, they're better than that. But really, you're better off being conservative. And then at worst, you'll just increase it faster. Um, that would be my recommendation. I, I don't know if I answered your question. I, I feel like kind of droned down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have an entire section on that a bit later. So uh, I'll, after I have another question break at the end, so you can ask me again if I didn't answer it properly uh, by then. Yeah. Carl Alexander .ca. Any other questions? All right, so um, the last little bit um, is about knowing your students. Uh, so you've decided you wanna start teaching, uh, but the best teachers uh, help their students be successful. And uh, that's something that's often forgotten. Um, you start writing and you're like, oh, I'm gonna publish this and it'll be great. But uh, really what you're trying to do is, is help somebody. Um, so with that in mind, you, you want to know who do you want to teach to? And that's always a good question to ask yourself um, before you even start. Uh, it, it's, it's a good question to ask yourself. Uh, so do you want to help your ideal clients? Do you want to help team designers, uh, buddy press users? Um, it's really tempted to want to help teach everyone because, oh, I have the largest pool of, of possible user, user um, not users, but people that I can help. Uh, so it's good for SEO or things like that. Sorry. Um, but it often leads to the worst results. Um, your teaching uh, feels generic and unmemorable. Um, it applies to everyone, but doesn't really help anyone. So, so what can you do about that? Well, you want to find your audience. Um, you want, a, you, want, you want a specific audience that you want to help. And there's no right way to pick an audience. Um, you really, you can pick one uh, based on your goals, but it's okay to not know either. Um, there's no right audience. Uh, the right audience is the one that you connect with as a person because uh, passion, I find, translates very well um, if you're passionate about something, people feel it. Um, so it's really, it's really important to, to at least have that, but there's no perfect audience. There's no like, oh, you're, you're a team designer, this should be your audience. Uh, you should pick something that makes sense to you. Uh, that's why you can start teaching and see where it leads you as well. Um, but what's important is to know where they hang out. And uh, this is a bit where knowing your audience kind of helps. Uh, because when you know where they hang out, uh, it could be a Facebook group, it could be a subreddit, it could be a Slack channel, it could be a forum. Um, 
it's actually invaluable sources of teaching material um, because they're there and they're talking about their problems and you can listen and then you can teach them how to solve them which is useful because if you're looking for material early on which is which is uh, difficult uh, it's an easy way to find some and then you even know where to share it it's where they hang out so that's it it does simplify things a lot and the last thing that you want to do is you want to stay in touch because um, knowing your audience in, in this day and age isn't enough. Um, you really need to build a bond with them um, because your potential students come from anywhere. And they often come once and never return. Um, so the best way that seems to come up over and over again is, uh, is email. Uh, email. Email marketing. Um, but the problem is that no one gives their email like that just like that so that's why you see a lot of exit pop-ups um, asking for your emails uh, websites think that uh, once they've taught you something valuable so if you've read through a large enough chunk of an article um, you might feel uh, more receptive uh, more willing to to give out your email to them and you should do the same uh, you should ask um, you should ask them for their email because Getting an email means that these people uh, care. Um, if, they, if they didn't care enough to give you their email, um, then you're probably not hitting a strong enough chord. So like an email is a really, really, really strong signal uh, if you're teaching the right thing. But a mistake that you see often is people ask for the email and then they never email back. And that's a bit, that builds a bit on the fear that you that we had earlier. Um, I remember one. I still remember, and I'm still scared sometimes to to send an email out because I'm just like maybe I haven't talked to them in, in long enough, and they'll forget about me, and I'll, I'll just get a whole bunch of unsubscribes. But it's it's really important to stay in touch because uh, otherwise they'll forget that you exist, and then they'll get an email from you, and they'll be like, "Who's this guy, Carl?" Like unsubscribe or spam. I've, I've never been flagged as spam yet, so like knock on wood, but uh, please don't flag me as spam. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the ideal scenario is that you want to try to keep in touch every few weeks. Um, I try to aim for two to three, uh, but definitely under a month. And now you can also ignore everything I said so far. Um, about your audience, the fears and the habits, please, please listen to that. Um, why? Because I didn't do any of that. Um, I wanted to teach about a topic that no one talked about, which is advanced programming uh, concepts related to WordPress. And I was just really passionate about teaching that. But I had no potential students. Um, I definitely had nowhere they hanged out. Um, they were in various agencies. Uh, I knew them through like work camps, like talking, but there was no dedicated aunt. And they had no questions that I had to answer. Uh, but, you know, I decided to do it anyways. Um, and this goes against everything I've mentioned so far, but, uh, and I felt that it was my due diligence to, to actually mention this because what I've talked so far is what I've read, what I've seen other people do. Um, what I've tried to implement myself, but it's also to show that if you're really passionate about something, uh, it's possible to do it. It's just a lot harder. Uh, it's a lot of work, um, again, because a lot of the little, le the little levers that you can use, having a place that, where they hang out, questions to answer, uh, things like that, you can't leverage them so much, so it's, it's kind of you paving the way um, for for them to know that you exist, but that's also why um, staying in touch is even more important in that scenario because since there's no hangout spot, you, you're kind of the hangout spot, at least that's like what I want to think. Uh, but yeah, closing thoughts. Uh, like I said already, uh, this this even if you don't do, uh, even if you use, 
uh, known hangout spots, uh, you're answering questions. Uh, it's, it's still a lot of work to do this. Um, obviously, you have to write a lot or publish content. Uh, you're going to be a noob, so like it's going to be 10 times harder to do it than somebody that's advanced. But keep in mind that every teacher that you know today was a beginner at some point. Um, and the only difference between you and them is that they started. Um, maybe they, they got there faster than you will, or maybe you'll get there faster than they did. Uh, but you won't know that unless you start. And there's no really a right time to start. Uh, it's just your fear is talking when you're like, oh, if I just had you know, this piece of code, or I, I, I can't even think I've, of reasons. I, I just made up a ton of reasons. Like Mostly, no, if nobody talked about it, then there was no reason for me to talk about it, was the one that came up often with me. Um, but the fact of the matter is uh, that moment doesn't exist. And if anything, one of the most uh, defining things that, that happened to me related to uh, just the advanced topics was um, at some point, I, I can't remember when, I just realized that if I didn't talk about it, nobody would. And that was the moment that I needed, but to each his own, obviously. Uh, but you'll just have to make the jump to figure it out. Thank you. Any other questions? Did I answer your question, by the way? So, so? I'm, I'm, my goal is to write a book right now. Um, but ideally, it's a mix of just writing a book, uh, promoting a project, projects, and just helping the community. Um, initially, it was to just start a business, but I, I figured out that I'm also a noob at that, so I, I'm just kind of figuring it out as I'm going. Yep. Yes. Um. Good question. Uh, this is my first non-technical talk, so I don't know if you guys liked it. Uh, if you did, then perfect. Uh, huh? It no, it needs more cowbells. I agree. Thank you. Um, one section that I I wanted to I actually haven't written it even in the article yet. Um, but that might be relevant to your question, is uh, empathy uh, towards your, your students in general. So it's really important, even for tech talks, um, especially for me, like, there's a million memes about me, like, you lost me at Hi, I'm Carl, uh, because usually I, I just talk about too advanced stuff, even for, for most WordPress technical people. Um, it's really th this idea of empathy, so trying to put yourself in the students' shoes, try to understand what, what's painful for them, um, over-explain. I, honestly, I, at this point, for even for uh, technical talks, I, I almost explain line by line the code in text uh, afterwards when I have a code sample, uh, just because that's what really um, I think works well is like if you try to put yourself in their shoes, what they might feel, what they might have as questions, it's, it's hard. Um, there's no perfect solution for it. Um, I try to put memes, but that, I don't know how much that works. That depends on the crowd as well. Uh, just try to be funny in yourself for the non-technical stuff, but I'm honestly figuring it out today. So, <laughs> Any other questions? Personal question, did I talk too fast? No? no? Okay, thank you. I thought I didn't talk too fast, but... I like the slides. Thank you. Yeah, that took me a long time. <laughs>
All right. Well, thank you.